Good evening, everybody. We're going to get started. I'm Professor Rockford, and welcome to the second annual Artist Talk series. This series was made possible with funding from the Broward College Student Life Faculty Enhancement Program Grant. The grant has allowed us to make all of these events free and open to the public. This is the first talk in a series of six visiting artists that will run through April of next year. Uh, there's some flyers on your seats and on the back table. Uh, there's also a survey on your seats. If you have time at the end of the talk to fill out the survey, that'll help us uh, with the grant funding as well to see how, what you thought of the talk. Um, this year, we also added a workshop component in addition to the lectures, and each artist will give a workshop on the following day. So all the talks are on Thursday nights, and there will be workshops at two on the, at, in the afternoon on the Friday following. Um, so this will allow you to see the way the artists work firsthand and learn a specific technique from them. Our speaker tonight, Virginia Fifield, will be giving a free workshop tomorrow in the art building, which is right across the driveway here, uh, at 2 p.m. on charcoal drawing techniques. Virginia is originally from Toronto, Canada, where she received her Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from York University and studied architecture at the University of Toronto. There she was awarded numerous grants and her work is held in public and private collections in Canada. In 1992, she moved to Florida and currently works from her studio in Hollywood, Florida. Fifield has continued to gain recognition and exhibit her artwork winning awards at the Boca Raton Museum of Art 60th Annual All Florida Juried Exhibition and won Best in Show at Art Florida 2008 and 2010. Virginia was granted solo exhibitions at the Art and Culture Center of Hollywood as well as Nova Southeastern University and her work was featured on PBS's TV show Art Street. The show highlighted David Caruso at Virginia's exhibition in Opera Gallery to benefit the South Florida SPCA and help abandoned and abused horses. Virginia Fifield serves on the Board of Directors for Art Serve in Fort Lauderdale and the Selection Committee for Public Art in Broward County. Her work is currently exhibited at Opera Gallery and held in public and private collections internationally. Please join me in welcoming Virginia Fifield. Thanks, Lisa, and thank you to Broward College for the, inviting me to speak here today. And thank you all for coming, I appreciate it. Um, so I'd like to give you a little bit of background and history because, um, you know, it's a long journey before we find ourselves and find our voice and, and our work. And uh, it, for me, it started in Toronto. And I was born there, grew up there, and pretty much always knew that I wanted to be an artist from a very, very young age and um, wound up studying at York University in Toronto. Um, I was at that time doing abstract paintings. Um, I don't have a lot of images of the work I was doing then because sort of everything before 1985 doesn't exist before the internet. <laughs> and a lot of the images I had were on slide. But um, I was doing um, paintings that I called cake paintings they were uh, done on canvas using acrylic paint very, very heavily. And the canvases were sewn and folded into a variety of shapes. And this was the work that when I graduated uh, York University that I was exhibiting through galleries and through public, um, public galleries as well. They were very, to me, they were about clothing and wearing clothing and that how clothing is very representational of us as people. We have our outside, our inside, and, and uh, they were very um, abstracted graphic forms, but at the same time, they were very uh, um, sculptural and not a typical way of using canvas, as you can see. Here's another view of that piece. And uh, I did a, a variety of works all in, in that theme. And I was working in this field um, for about five or six years. 
after I graduated York right away, I got a job at the Banff School of Fine Arts teaching uh, the master class and then also getting working as head assistant to the fine art department there and, um, and getting a great studio in Banff National Park in the Rocky Mountains. It was very cool. But it was also very isolated and I was very anxious to come back to Toronto and pursue my career, which I did. But even though my work was doing fairly well and everything, I always found that I had to have another job to support myself. And I was very frustrated by that. And I was also very frustrated by, um, it just seemed that we were having art exhibitions and the art exhibitions were always attended by other artists. And I didn't feel like my work was really communicating to a broader audience. And I was really in the mind that, that I would think about, you know, what's going to be remembered from our generation in fine arts? And I felt that it would be film and architecture because I was kind of, you know, really watching the art world move towards performance and video art and conceptual art and really leaving, you know, two-dimensional art behind. So I wound up going back to school and I studied architecture at the University of Toronto because I thought that, well, I'm going to make really big sculpture. <laughs> and I went there uh, for two years. And in my second year after I graduated, um, actually my husband and I both went back to school. We both have degrees in fine arts and we both decided that we wanted to study architecture. We were also looking for something that would utilize our talents and our skills and our ideas in a way that we could actually get paid. And lo and behold, we get into architecture school and every, every one of our professors said, what are you doing here? You're artists. We all want to be artists. Like, you know, we can't really do what we want as architects. You know, we're so restricted by, you know, the client, the developers, the, the zoning and, and everything. And they were kind of looking at us, scratching our head. But um, after our second year, we got this really neat job to build a model of Toronto's waterfront. Um, a huge portion of Toronto's waterfront was turned into, was purchased and turned into, um, into public park. It was supposed to be public park. And if you can kind of see it, let's see if the mouse will help us here. So from here, there we go, the mouse. From here up to the railway lands, here you can see the railway track go across, and all across here, this whole area from the the lake to the railway lands was all been purchased by the federal government and gifted to the city of Toronto. And the idea was, was that development space was sold, the air rights was sold to the developers to build apartments and, and office spaces. And then the money from that was put into keeping the whole ground plane public space. And they built art galleries and dance theaters and outdoor performance venues and there was retail shopping, and it's there now, and it's, it's really amazing. And I was really fortunate to get, to, um, to get this job uh, building this model, which was six feet by 26 feet long of the waterfront, but all of the ground plain. Anyway, by the end of the summer, I was so exhausted getting it done, and we hired all our friends, and we made lots of money and paid off all our tuitions and had money left over, which was amazing. But this was an enormous model. But so exhausted at the end that I just, I got into my third year and I just couldn't, couldn't continue. I just felt like I needed a breather. So I quit my job, or I quit, dropped out of school thinking I'm just going to take a year off. And then I got a call from Harborfront and they realized that I'd done the drawings of the whole site and that I knew every square inch of harbor front, so they offered me a job. And so I was really fortunate to work in urban planning and the development of the city, and I was working with architects who were putting up buildings there. A lot of them were my professors <laughs> from, from architecture school, and it was really, really a great experience. But, um, and then during that, I had, I had, we had our first child, and we were struggling to live. My husband um, 
is from Florida, believe it or not. And although I met him up in Toronto and we got married there, we were always going back and forth from Florida to Toronto. And when our son was three years old, we decided to take a break and come down to spend a longer time to have his family see us and see their grandchild. And I put this picture back up here because I'm reminding you how cold it is in Toronto for eight months of the year. And when I came to Florida for that longer visit, I suddenly found myself visiting a place like this, which is the Bonnet House in Fort Lauderdale. And if you haven't visited, you should, because it was the home of artists and very wealthy artists who had collected an amazing collection of uh, contemporary art, Picasso's, Matisse, and actually they're the incredible connection, collection of impressionistic art that's at the Chicago Art Institute is all from this family donated to them. So this is a, a wonderful, wonderful place to visit. Anyway, I coming from Toronto and working, finding myself working in this urban planning and everything, I just was so happy to be here and to be so moved by nature. I wasn't really making art then and I was really spending more time with my son but we were going camping and going into the Everglades and I was taking photographs of amazing birds that we don't have in Canada and um, really, really loving it and even taking photographs of birds on my front lawn. <laughs> So compared to Canada, it, you know, it, it really had a profound impact on me. But at the same time, I absolutely found Florida and the Everglades to be a spiritually moving place. And the connection to the animals and the wildlife here just seems so valuable. But at the same time, I was deeply disturbed and concerned on how we are changing our world. And this was the, the crux that I found, you know, some, you know, 15 years later after graduating art school that really possessed me and began to motivate my artwork and getting back into my artwork. And at first, I just started drawing. I wasn't planning on exhibiting or anything. It was just, just for me. And I started doing large scale black and white drawings much like the charcoal over here, of birds. And I did them almost on human scale, so they're in your face, they're confrontational, they're not drawn in a sentimental way. I didn't want them sentimentalized. I didn't want them to be cartoonized, stylized. And I felt that birds really represented the magnificence and the fragility of the Florida environment. And I was searching through this process of doing these drawings for, for a way to express how I felt. And um, I felt that birds largely were drawn either in a stylized manner, like I said, or they were almost done like, um, like for biological anatomical stuff, like Audubon, you know, his work is very stylized and very anatomical. And I wanted something that would really capture the spirit and of, of these creatures. So over the years, I began slowly producing these, you know, going out, taking photographs, and producing these, the screaming gull I love because to me, he's like, he's screaming at us, you know, like, what are you doing to the world? And I was hoping that I would find a way of giving a voice to their magnificence, their fragility, their incredible uniqueness and beauty. This is a roseate spoonbill, although you can't see the spoonbill. <laughs> and the wood storks, cormorants, and ospreys. And laughing gull. 
And while I was doing these, I was thinking, oh, nobody's going to take me seriously as a fine artist doing birds. So I thought, I need to do, find another way to express my idea. And so I became, started doing urban landscapes. And these were um, paintings that formed a series of commonplace urban landscapes and images that examine our unnatural and often unconscious impact on our environment. And um, I got the images from just the everyday things that I would see around myself that I would take for granted. Um, the side of a transport truck at night with the shadow of a tree cast upon the side of it. I felt, you know, really spoke to, you know, our impact on the natural world. And the concern that where is the tree, what's happening to it, is it just a shadow, is it lost, and moving from there. So, and I was doing these paintings and I was showing them and I was, you know, getting, you know, some recognition and winning awards and shows. But I was still doing some of these charcoal drawings um, in between these. And this is a forest, which is actually a painting from a photograph I took at uh, Sawgrass Mills parking lot, where a forest, you know, is planted and exists in a, in a parking lot. And um, water, which is such a valuable element, and that's just right around the corner from my house. And there it is, you know, protected in, in this incredible, you know, hydrant. And then uh, doubly protected because they put this thing to keep people from driving into it, I guess. And um, this piece is called an island, where an island is now a single species of grass bordered by concrete in a sea of asphalt, you know? And this is how we are transforming and expect our environment to be. And it comes unconsciously and it comes at a price. Parking lot at night. The front porch I really liked because um, my neighbor had these um, lions out front and their tongues were missing, which is like they can't speak. You know, I don't know if they were intended to be used as fountains. But here, you know, on the front porch, nature is that little bit of grass in front. And in the back, you've got your, your herbicide round up. And water is held in a tube. And the lions, who we regard as, you know, the magnificent animals in nature, are kind of stiltified and stylized and we no longer see animals so much you know we we get so much information on nature we we're so inundated through media that we think oh we know what a lion is we know what a bird is but really we see it as as a word and it's not until you really I felt you know I would draw it in its richness and all its details and its scale and size you know, staring back at us, do we really start to encounter them again and see them for the first time? I like this image. Um, I lived in New Orleans for three or four years. Just because it has a nice mood, the way the house and the plants are all shaped and toned, and then there's the suggestion of a statue of Mary and religion and it just to me it has a lot of mystery and uh, speaks to our relationship to the world and our spirituality in good and bad ways and while I was doing that I was taking photographs too of sidewalks and I just really liked the interaction of the grass and the concrete and to me they spoke a lot of time and permanence and again our effect on the, the world. So 
So I was searching for different ways to express how I felt and through different medium and materials and putting the images together where I like the kind of compression of the concrete on the on the nature, which again is a single species, you know, which speaks to our management of nature and how we are attempting to control it. Doing small pieces called Urban Paradise. And then I did a table called a picnic table, which um, is uh, it's steel and glass, but it has um, uh, artificial grass in there. And I like the idea of it. It's like when you sit at the table, you're almost having a picnic, but you're sitting. But it speaks to the food that we're we're eating. And here's this grass, which is a single species. You know, we are constantly mowing over nature and planting grass and wanting it to be trimmed and just so perfect. And yet, it, it's not a sustainable way to live on this world. And, uh, and I hope that the table kind of speaks to that. And then... Um, these were photographs that I really loved of the sidewalks where the flowers were falling on the sidewalk, but you could see their impression from the previous years when the concrete had been poured some years ago. And obviously the tree had lost its flowers and they had become impressed into the concrete. And then walking along and finding that I must be at the same time of year that it was made before, got me thinking about time and permanence and our effect. And I was using also um, a string that I was drawing across, and the string shadow would be cast here. So again, talking about the distance of things and the time and the memory, the suggestion of of it, I found these rather intriguing. So um, I um, had an exhibition, and uh, I won um, Art Bravo, which was uh, the big exhibition at um, Artser one year. And that year they decided to have an, a special exhibition of the winners that won awards for Art Bravo. So I had um, won for two of the urban landscape paintings. And um, so they, they gave me uh, extra space in the, the exhibition. And, uh, and then there was someone who had won in photography, but he was a student and he really didn't have a body of work to show. So they called me up and they said, can you bring in any more work? So I said, sure, you know, uh, I've got some drawings. So suddenly I was exhibiting the charcoal drawings of birds, and I put them in the show, and everybody just kind of went, wow. And uh, they kind of forgot about the paintings. And I guess that was, it was at that point that I realized that there, these drawings were some, unique, and they had a voice, and they were powerful. And I, was, and I got a really strong response to it. So I wound up exploring more into the, these drawings. And I started a series I call the Pneumatico series. And uh, started with this, it was my friend's uh, greyhound that was a rescue. And uh, he had been uh, a racing horse, and hence the name, formerly number 36, who had been adopted. But he was just an amazing creature. and my dog, <laughs> and uh, that one actually went in Art Florida. Um, I just really liked that kind of look, like, you know, it's like, well, I want to listen to you, but I really want to follow my true nature, you know? If you have dogs, you know what that is. <laughs> and I began to start to draw horses and other animals because I was starting to think about our relationship to the animals that we
domesticated too and our rather odd and unnatural relationship. This one is called bull baiter because I don't think very many people know. Does anybody know what a bull baiter is or what that means here? No. It started in England, well, probably in Europe, and uh, they used to use dogs to capture bulls. And uh, dogs would, if, like horses, I believe, and, do and, and cows and, and bulls, if you grab them by the nose, they become immobilized. And so butchers and farmers used to use dogs to immobilize the uh, cows and other animals so that they could do whatever they had to do, whether they were, you know, neutering them or treating them in some manner. And the bulldog actually evolved out of that because they were constantly breeding dogs that were really effective at immobilizing bulls. And it became a sport that people used to bet on with other dogs to see which dog would win. And the, the bulldog evolved because it has this ginormous jaw that latches on to the bull's nose and it's got this little tiny body in behind so it can't sort of get swung off. And it was a, a big um, sport in England especially and people would bet on it and dogs were bred to be more and more effective, hence the bulldog. But uh, it was banned because it was deemed rather cruel because a lot of the dogs didn't always fare so well. But um, we look at dogs and we don't realize, you know, it, this speaks to the incredible impact that we have on, on animals by, through our breeding and through using animals and our relationship to them. This is a horse. A friend of mine actually uh, takes photographs of horses. And this horse apparently had won over a million dollars and was living a very nice life in, on a stud farm. <laughs> but I just really like that look of how he is looking at us and, um, you know, and his value is based on, on you know, his performance. And Rocco. The relationship we have, the tension between the animal and our, our desires. This is a friend's dog, he's a puppy at the time, but I just love this big goopy dog with the underbite, and he's got this collar on, tough, you know. <laughs> and again, this old dog with, you know, the collar, the chains, the, speaks to our ownership and management. And then, the Lost series, I started in 2009. Um, the recession had hit, and we were, people were losing their homes. Um, there was, you know, the economic crisis. People were having to give up their animals, horses, dogs, because they were losing their homes. And I would hear about it a lot on the radio, um, people who would, you know, not want to take their dogs to the Humane Society and the shelter for fear of it being euthanized. And so they drop it off in the Everglades as though they were returning this animal who's been domesticated for hundreds and hundreds of years that it would know how to survive in the Everglades, which was beyond cruel. But um, I guess, you know, I, through the dogs, I um, uh, wanted to portray that feeling of loss that we were experiencing as well as the animals and through this and again speaking to our relationship and our management of them and the impact that we have on them. Oops. Sorry. There. And so I did a series of these. I was going to was approached by a gallerist in Miami and we were talking about doing a show with the Humane Society that ultimately wound up not following through, which was okay, but that's why I was doing more dogs then because we were looking to do an exhibition to, um, to help the Humane Society and help the dogs. And these are all quite big, or almost 
four feet by five feet in charcoal on white paper. That was really hard to do, to get those grays and charcoal. <laughs> I had to, uh, I did the water first because I figured if I can't get the water right, it's not going to work, but it, I figured it out. I really have developed a lot of techniques on my own um, to handle charcoal. Um, I really didn't get a class in it. When I went to art school, the last thing you could do, or the worst thing you could do, was be a realist. And drawing was barely taught at that time. And everybody was really into abstract painting and performance, artwork. And so a lot of this, I wound up just figuring it out. Um, also, while I was working on these, I was um, getting work uh, doing faux finishes and specializing in wood graining, where I would paint wood. And I worked a lot on the big mega yachts in Fort Lauderdale, because they would have these white watertight doors in white metal. And then they'd have these beautiful interiors and all finished out in exotic woods. And they wanted these doors, um, which couldn't be wood because they needed to be watertight. They wanted them painted to match the wood. And I wound up um, doing that, which was really good work because it paid really well. <clears throat> and I only had to work maybe once every three months, like take a job for a couple weeks. And then I was good and I had my studio paid for so I could continue to work. So, um, but the point of that was that every wood is so unique and it's re you really have to look. And that experience really helped me hone my eye because drawing is 90% looking and looking at what you really see not what you think you see and once you can develop that eye it becomes a lot easier to draw and doing wood graining very few people do it and it's pretty hard it usually winds up taking like seven to ten coats of paint of layers build up to get that wood and that richness. And I developed a lot of my own techniques. So when I was working on the charcoal drawings, I just felt very free to use whatever I thought would work to achieve whatever effect I wanted. <clears throat> and so that was the last in that series of drawings. And so, um, when I had an exhibition of some of my work at the Art and Culture Center. And when I was there, a woman from the South Florida SPCA that works specifically with horses came to my opening and contacted me and invited me to come to their rescue ranch to see it. And when I was there, I met the director of the Opera Gallery, who really loves horses and had read an article about them rescuing horses and helping prevent uh, slaughter of horses. Maybe you've heard about that in the news. And um, she told him about my work and he contacted me and then really liked my work and just wanted to help the SBCA. And then in invited me uh, to show in an exhibition at Opera Gallery to benefit the SPCA and help the horses. And this was the cover from the catalog of that exhibition. And um, that was also filmed on Art Street and David Caruso, uh, who he said, uh, oh yeah, I'm going to invite uh, David Caruso. You know who he is, right? And I sort of went, and I'm thinking, what an artist, it's David Caruso. And I get home and I'm like Googling and all that's coming up is the actor from CSI and I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> it's him. So, and then he invited Romero Brito who did his piece for the show and it was a, a very successful exhibition. And a couple days after he told me that, he called me and uh, invited me to come to the gallery and said that 
that they, opera galleries were interested in representing my work permanently. So that was a great honor. Um, they have 11 galleries around the world in the most exclusive places. That's their marketing shtick. They're here in Miami and Bell Harbor. Shops in London and New York and Soho and throughout Europe and uh, Singapore and Beijing. So it's been a great, um, I no longer have to um, do wood graining <laughs> anymore. And I'm actually, you know, starting to survive on my sales. But, um, and they, when I first started exhibiting with them, they were doing really, really well with my work. And, um, and I'm still really fortunate to be with this gallery. And so I began to do um, a number of horses, and that was for the Save the Horses exhibition. And, um, and while these were drawings that were intended to definitely portray these magnificent animals, they were also speaking to the tattoos, the ownership, the bridles, their presence, their looking at us, the ways that they are managed and handled is, is all part of it. Um, a lot of people buy the work because they love horses, but um, I hope that they also see the intention in the work, which is a questioning of our relationship and our sense of ownership of nature and our management of it. This is probably four feet by six feet, so they're really, you know, almost life size. And this was a piece that actually won the award at the Boca Raton Museum of Art, and it's four feet by six feet. And um, it was really a homage to my father who had passed away. Um, a friend of mine, uh, mother had passed away the year before and I had helped her with the funeral. So when she heard that my father had passed away, she brought me this gorgeous bouquet of tulips and they were just magnificent. And um, she met me at the studio and then um, I had to go to Canada for several weeks to help with the funeral and make the arrangements. And when I came back, the tulips were still in the vase and they were, there was no water. It, they had dried up completely, but not a single petal had fallen from the tulips, which is kind of odd because every time I've had tulips before, they just start dropping like crazy. And they were so beautiful. And I felt that um, my father was a very spiritual person. He definitely influenced me. He, he loved nature and he always was very observant and we shared, you know, a lot of, you know, joy in, in looking at nature together and birds, and, which obviously has influenced me. But I thought that this was a really nice kind of homage to him, and uh, that, as in life, it's beautiful and death, and and uh, so I decided to draw it, and I'm really glad I did. <laughs> but uh, and. This is a drawing of the American alligator. It was commissioned by the University of Florida to do this. It's almost 10 feet long, pretty much almost life size. And uh, I wound up, you know, going out and photographing alligators. And the, ironically, the image that I wound up selecting <laughs> was an image I'd taken years before when I visited Clyde Butcher's studio. <laughs> outside of his house, there's an alligator that he goes out and he claps his hands and she sort of comes up and comes towards you. And uh, apparently she's fondly named Barbie. <laughs> and anyway, I had actually taken a photograph of this alligator and this was the one that was wind up, wound up being used, which was kind of funny. But, uh, 
Yeah, and then afterwards I started drawing it and I was kind of really regretting it because I had the, the reflection and it, it took me three months to draw it. And again, the horses. This is about seven feet long by four feet. While I was photographing um, the alligators, I was at the Everglades and there was an alligator sleeping. I was walking on the Broadwalk and the Anhinga Trail at um, the Everglades National Park. And I looked down and its palm was there. And I just thought it was like incredible, uh, such an incredible thing that it, it I was just so struck by the incredible complexity and it looked like a glove and, and yet at the same time the palm you know although alligators are kind of feared the palm really spoke to its vulnerability I felt and then it's missing a toenail and once I started it I really instantly regretted it because I remembered how many months I had spent drawing the alligator <laughs> and it took forever. Your eyes start crossing after a while trying to figure out where you started. Oh, sorry, I hit that too fast. There. <gasps> okay. This was a um, red shouldered hawk. I walk my dog every morning and um, I found a this dead red-shouldered hawk in the alleyway behind the houses. And um, it just was like in magnificent condition. I couldn't see any reason why it would be dead. So I called up the Wildlife Care Center and I said, I just found this hawk. Are you interested in knowing why it's dead? Because I can't see any reason, you know, maybe it's a bird flu or something weird. And they said, oh, absolutely. We, you know, can you bring it in? So I took it to them and they looked at it and they said, you know, they asked me where I had found it and if it was near any power lines. And I said, yes, as a matter of fact, it was. And they said, well, you know, that's a possibility. But anyway, they called me later that day and they told me that it, in fact, had been electrocuted. And because I gave them the location, they were contacting FPL to let them know that there was a problem with the lines. <coughs> And when I walked my dog later that night, the FBL truck was out there repairing it. So it was kind of a great opportunity for me to take lots of photographs of this bird up close. But I wanted to find a way to honor it. And, and, um, and again, you know, it speaks to our impact on nature, but it also speaks to our ability to help. And I think we're kind of caught in that dichotomy right now <clears throat> where we have um, we are having such a profound impact but we also have the ability to make some decisions if we do make them and consider our management because I really believe that we are becoming stewards of this planet and we need to be good stewards otherwise we are making this world a less beautiful place. And uh, I just love the way the squirrel's just kind of looking at us again, you know, that kind of questioning. This is a pole, and already it's been tattooed with um, its DG, DJEL2 from such a young age. Again, a, a type of dog, a, a type of bulldog or boxer puppy, you know, and I liked the way the hands are kind of speaking to our management of it. Again, it's been managed by its breeding and then by its owner. I really like this one because this was a photograph of a cockaded woodpecker um, that was being banded and held by uh, biologists and they were tagging it. And it, again, bird in the hand speaks to our, our control, our management, our impact. 
and also our ability to help. The uh, drawing that I brought over here, which after the talk, if you haven't seen it already, you can uh, get a sense of these drawings. They are just charcoal on paper, nothing else. Groomed, again, the management of and shaping nature to our taste. This was a, a ram that was at the SPCA rescue ranch. He apparently had been found on a farm starving and they wound up keeping him and he was the best ambassador for the SPCA because he was so super friendly. But I, you know, he only wound up to be about six years old before he died because many of these farm animals are not bred to, for longevity because they usually are, are slaughtered for food you know by the time they're two years old so yeah not a long life but he had a good one by the end <laughs> and this is a quote by Aldo Leopold that I really really liked that really summed up um, how I feel is that we abuse nature because we regard it as a commodity belonging to us when we see nature as a community to which we belong, may we, we may begin to use it with love and respect. And I hope that my work inspires people to love and respect nature. I try not to be, be depressing. I, I mean, there's so many things that you could do to express our impact on nature, but I really try to keep it more positive and more inspirational than, than critical of us. And I hope that, um, that my work succeeds in this manner. Um, this is an installation shot at uh, the Sailboat Bend 1310 Gallery, an exhibition I had there. So you get a sense of the scale of the work. And then in January, my work was at the uh, Lee Wagner Art Gallery at the Fort Lauderdale Airport. So often when I enter drawings into competitions and they look at slides or rather digital images, I don't think people get a sense of the scale of the work. So I like to include um, installation shots. And um, tomorrow I'm gonna to be doing a workshop uh, at 2 p.m. Uh, in the ceramic studio across from here. If you're interested in learning about some of the techniques that I've learned uh, in drawing in charcoal, you're welcome to attend. And um, here are some progression shots so you get a sense of some of the work. This is a piece, I, um, I work vertically, that way all the dust falls off. <laughs> and I am right-handed so I work from left to right. So, I, so that my hand is not smearing the work that I've done. So you can see that I start to work across and down in the work. This is the alligator. Sometimes I remember to take these shots and then other times I'm just, <laughs> I'm not that good. But this one I did. So you can start to see how it starts to progress and evolve. I start out, I grid my photograph and then I grid my drawing, usually about five or six inch square grids on the drawing, so that I get a sense of the proportion and that helps me get my lines in the right place. And I draw them very, very lightly in pencil, graphite pencil, HB, because it can be erased. But I have particular charcoals and racers and pencils that I use that allow me to really bring, bring it up into high detail. And you can see where some of the drawing is, like often in pencil and then very, very light tones so that they can be erased. And then the, the rest of the shadow. Yeah. 
finished. And that's it. So thank you very much. And um, Yes. <laughs> yeah. You have to really, in your mind, when you look at an image, is you have to flatten it. And you have to see it as an abstract. So what I actually do is sometimes I make like little square masks and I lay them down. So I can't tell what it is. And all it is is a shapes and tones and I work like that. When you start working in detail like this you have to forget almost what your subject is um, and you so you really have to learn to see flat it, it's it's tricky, but <laughs> once you make that conceptual leap, then you can draw almost anything once you start developing the right techniques. Yes? Can, can you talk about why you like black and white more than working in color? Right. Uh, good question. Um, I decided to stay with black and white because, one, I find it it's kind of dramatic, and I also... It's not just, my drawings are not just about representation, and I feel that if I did them in color, then it's, people would think it's more representational. Like it's just about, you know, a nice drawing of a bird or a horse. And I don't want to take it to that level, so I, I, I just stop with the black and white. And I, I think it gives it some drama and contrast, you know. Yes? Yes. No, uh, I'm bringing all the supplies. So um, I'm bringing the charcoals and the erasers. I, I draw a lot with my erasers um, by removing charcoal, where you can tone it in and then erase to some degree, you know? And that gives you the different grays through erasing. And I use. Um, chamois or paper towel to blend and I also wear uh, gloves, grab, um, latex gloves when I draw. That way I, when they get dirty I can take them off and I can keep my hands clean and my drawing clean. But I find that my gloves get impregnated with charcoal and start getting really black and I actually wind up using them to blend and they, they give a very, they they just give that beautiful velvet deepness on the, um, the nose of a horse. <laughs> that really fine, skin, velvety skin, you know, when, you, when I use my fingers and just rub it on the paper. And the type of paper I use is enormously um, important into the drawings. Um, I've done some workshops um, with students where um, they have started drawings and then I come in halfway and work with them. And some of them, you know, think that they're going to um, really do a really good job and they go out and they buy like a really good paper, like Arches, like a better paper than I've asked them to. But unfortunately, it's a watercolor paper and it's got a lot of texture. And it also doesn't erase well. It's meant to absorb water. And so when you draw with it, and then you go to erase it, it actually will peel right off. It doesn't erase very well. So the type of paper you use is really critical. You need something that's, that's got a nice tooth so the charcoal will stick to it. And you need something also that will erase so that it doesn't damage the paper. Or um, kind of like leave a shadow. Like sometimes on some papers, and even still I have that problem, where you erase something and then you go to shade onto it and the, because the paper's been roughed up by the eraser, the charcoal will stick to that area where you did some erasing and be darker and actually it'll show up, which can be tricky. 
<laughs> so there's a few little pitfalls there, but so I will um, I will go over all that at the workshop tomorrow. Yes. Um, how do you decide which details to omit when you're kind of centering on the subject? And I guess I kind of want to specifically bring it back to that one image of the hawk with the eye that was removed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that either the eye was still there or maybe the socket was it, exposed. The, the, d the detail was lost a little bit. It, it's actually the eyelid of the hawk, which you rarely ever see. And actually, the, it's, got, it's all covered in the tiniest white little feathers. And, but I kind of like the way that it sort of has that hollow emptiness in it. But um, yes, to answer your question, I, I feel that um, my drawings are very edited. I spend a lot of time with my photographs, laying them out, and I do small sketches so that I know exactly how I want them to be on the page. Because once I start putting that dark charcoal, it's not coming off. You can erase to lighten it, but it's not coming off. So I really spend a lot of time um, um, you know, placing it on the page, but also really minimizing the background, just enough to sort of weight it, maybe, to make it feel like it's not floating. But I, I really want to focus in on to subject. And, um, and yes? How long did it take you to get that level of detail in your Years. <laughs> yeah, I mean, even when I look at the earlier ones of the birds, I kind of go, oh, <laughs> I see <laughs> things that I've learned since then. So it really, it really takes a lot of time before you, you get a lot of hours. Um, Malcolm Gladwell says that before you achieve a certain degree of mastery in whatever you do, it's like, what, 10,000 hours or something? I don't know if it was that long, but yeah, it, it, it takes some practice. I mean, you know, when I started, I was kind of okay, but I think I, I've definitely gotten better. Yeah. Yes? No, I do not. Um, no, those fixatives are going to, are, have some kind of lacquer or some sort of varnish on them, and they will yellow. And I use the white of my paper, so I, I figure that if I spray them on there, there's gonna, it's going to look eventually like yellow overspray. And I really work the charcoal into the paper. It does not fall off. Um, I, when I was in university, there was a really good um, class that I took on art historical techniques, and we learn to make our own charcoal, our own pastels, and grind our own oil paint. And um, one of the things that I remembered learning was uh, Degas, who worked in pastel, he would, um, when he finished a piece, he would uh, put a type of wax paper on top of it and then just weight it and leave it for a couple of weeks so that it really got impressed. And his work is considered like the most archivally perfect because it's almost pure pigment. Um, pastel is mostly pigment with just a little bit of binder, so the color doesn't change. And because he did so little and no spraying, or which they didn't really have then anyway, um, they feel that his colors are, are, are true as when he first did them. And so when I was doing my charcoal, I really felt, well, if I can really get that charcoal worked into the, the paper, I, I shouldn't have to worry about Fixatives. Yes, you had a question? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, for people who want to pursue art, well, it's, it's a hard life, but it's an absolutely interesting life. It, um, it affords you the opportunity to meet all kinds of really wonderful people who are following their passions. Um, it doesn't always, isn't always a way to, to uh, financially survive. Um, I mean, even still, you know, my work with the gallery, you know, the sales some years are great and other years it's like, ooh, <laughs> you know, not so great. And you just never know. But 
it's just something that is incredibly rewarding to to me personally and if you know people can sort of throw their faith to the wind and hope that everything will turn out you know, it's, it's not a career for the faint of heart <laughs> but it's fun yeah. any other questions well thank you so much for coming out tonight I appreciate your attention Thank you. 